helicopter scenic tour over the beautiful Grand Canyon, and then Hoover Dam and much more. Value of this entire luxury stay in Las Vegas is more than $2,000 per couple, and it can be yours. Save those Luxor bonus coupons and follow directions. They'll lead you to this great Luxor luxury Las Vegas tour. satellite system, a good programming guide is an absolute necessity. OnSat packs more viewing information in its 88-page weekly format than any other program guide, including daily primetime highlights in a handy grid format, plus complete listings in an easy-to-read rolling log, daily sports listings by category, the largest alphabetical movie description of any satellite guide, a complete listing of satellite locations and each transponder and much, much more. All of this can be yours for only $45 per year. That's less than $1 per week. We're so sure you'll like OnSat that we would like to send you a free sample copy. Pick up the telephone and call toll-free now for your free copy of OnSat. Call 1-800-438-2020. That's 1-800-438-2020. Welcome back. I'm Joe Boyle. Here with me is Robert Neidert and Jerry Fischette. And just to briefly wrap up what we discussed on the adverse advertising, I think that if you do have problems in this area, we want you to know that there are several resources available. You can call space directly, and we can provide you with details on any number of our programs concerning the Consumer Awareness Program the local PR campaign that's scheduled to run within the next couple of weeks, the ad slicks that we're presenting, the additional information that's going to be present in uh, SatVision, and any other future programs that we will be doing. Now for the next segment of this hour, we'd like to bring up another topic that has generated quite a bit of interest. And it's an also complicated uh, issue. It's zoning. The issue itself has a lot of legal ramifications, and Robin, why don't you discuss some of these in order to just summarize basically what the problems are. I think you summed it up rather well, Joe. Complicated. <laughs> Describes zoning very accurately. And I'm sure you'll uncomplicate <laughs> it. The real problem with zoning, as everyone around the country has probably experienced by now, either by reading about it or unfortunate direct experience is that the zoning laws differ from local county to local government to local township around the country. There's no uniform zoning law. Addition installation that's allowed in one county isn't allowed in another town, isn't allowed in another state possibly. That's the problem with zoning and it's a battle that has had to be fought on the local area from scratch each and every single time. You had to start with a new city council, a new ordinance and approach it like that. And I think that's what, that, that really the number of zoning problems and the tremendous impact they were having on, we think, sales and, and installations around the country led space to have Brown and Finn go to the FCC and ask for relief. And we really were asking for relief when we filed a petition for rulemaking last spring asking the federal government to federally preempt local zoning laws that discriminate against satellite earth station installations. And that will probably provide the industry with the greatest relief possible. What federal preemption does is it simply says that local zoning ordinances cannot be discriminatory, they can't be unfair, they can't single out earth stations for some kind of burdensome standard that they have to meet. And hopefully we'll have a decision out of the FCC by the end of this year. That's the word that we're hearing now. And although it would be premature to guess what that decision would be. I think we are optimistic at this point. We have certainly made the industry's needs known to the Federal Communications Commission, and I must say they are sympathetic to the fact that in one town you can have a 10-foot dish, and the next town you can have a 3-foot dish. You know, they can see that that doesn't make any sense, and that it truly discriminates and interferes with some people's ability to receive communication, which we think is a federally protected right. Well, I noticed that some of the uh, municipalities, it seems that they almost get down to weighing the rights of the consumer to have an ability to view the programming 
versus the rights of the community itself in terms of the aesthetic appeal of the dish and whether yes, or not the neighbor true. finds it unattractive or not. And you could see where it, it would get down to be a, uh, a real battle. It does. And unfortunately, the petition for rulemaking at the FCC does not will not give us immediate relief. What it will do, it will say that the federal government federally preempts any zoning regulation that is unreasonable under the law. But then if the city council doesn't change its zoning regulation or if a zoning board refuses to change what we think is a regulation that doesn't comply, then we'll have to go to court. And I think the general consensus is that we will probably have to go to court in a number of areas around the country to get existing zoning ordinances changed after the FCC, if the FCC releases a favorable decision on this. So the battle isn't over. Lexor, the intelligent satellite system. The top of the line complete satellite system by Lexor. Space age technology wrapped in a compact, attractive package. The Luxor 9900 system knows where all the satellites are and all about stereo hi-fi sound. All you need to know is what show that you want to watch. Combine it with the premier quality aluminum mesh antennas and you have an unbeatable package. The antennas that stay in shape and stay on target. Five-year warranty. UPS shippable. Durable, baked on, acrylic, low luster finish. The perfect match for the 9900. Luxor, the intelligent satellite system. I'm Joe Kelsch with an announcement for you dealers out there. Would you like a TV commercial produced for you at a cut rate? If so, you can join the Space Dealer Consumer Awareness Program. The purpose is to drive potential Earth Station owners to your store for a demonstration of your equipment. The program will be supported with national and local advertising with your store name listed in all ads. You'll receive the complete dealer kit with point of purchase material. Make checks payable to Space Sweepstakes. Space Sweepstakes. And mail to Space at 300 North Washington Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. The phone number for space is 703-549-6990. If you have any questions, you can also call Dave Vengus at the Litchfield Group. His number is 212-598-0600. You can charge it to your Visa, Master Charge, or American Express card. The cost is $300 plus $50 per store if you want the TV spot produced for you that you can tag on with your store's name. Radio spots available too. This is the Space Dealer Consumer Awareness Program. If you have questions, you can call Space or Dave Vengus at the numbers listed on the screen. might not be aware, but some months ago, uh, Derek Humphreys of Brown and Finn and myself conceived of an idea to help us in another little issue that we all have as dealers, and that has to be with the zoning issue. And uh, that's something I know that's close to most of your hearts. So we have a massive city here that has, that was in the process of uh, putting together some zoning legislation that would have been totally restrictive to our industry. So what we decided to do was to offer them a little learning experience that we're doing here today, by the way. And this learning experience would be consist of a satellite dish antenna installed in the district building, which is the center of the government here, the local government in the District of Columbia. And it would be uh, fed to the mayor's office and a few other places so that they could get an idea of what the industry was all about. Well, lo and behold, the legislation came up for review and voting in June of this year, and guess what they did with it? They did not do anything with it, they tabled it for future uh, looking at. So what we're now doing, this uh, symbolic dish here, we wanted to make a presentation to the mayor, and uh, we were a little late in getting the invitation to him, 
the courier dropped the ball. So he was unable to do so. He asked his uh, aide, Clifford Smith, uh, who's actually the secretary of the District of Columbia, to come and, and produce it. We don't know why he hasn't shown up. And I've met with Clifford on many occasions. At any rate, the, the installation will be at the district building where there's tremendous terrestrial interference. So we have a challenge and a half. In fact, the, uh, we'd like to put a little uh, plug in here for the folks at Microwave Filter. They were kind enough to send a crew down all day to do tests and uh, really get us an idea of what we were up against. We feel we can conquer the problem, and we feel that we uh, will be able to put into this system, and then hopefully that will help them to see what we're doing so that legislation can be enacted and passed so that uh, finally we'll get some model zoning legislation for cities. So that's what it's about, and I'll accept it on behalf of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much. Well, that dish is pretty small. I hope it works. National Microdynamics in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, National Microdynamics is a major supplier in the southeast. How the, much of the southeast, uh, where we both come from, is rural, how important is uh, satellite TV to people in our region? We see it as the most important technological advance of this century, and as it becomes a household word and an everyday item, we see this importance increasing. Okay, here we are back in the Russell Building, and I'm sitting here with Doris and Harry Vick from Russellville, Kentucky of Home Satellite Sales. Doris and Harry are, are uh, dealers uh, back in Russellville, and they're here representing uh, the dealers of uh, Kentucky, I guess. Doris, what do you think of Washington, D.C.? I love it. It's been years since I've been here, but I'm enjoying it. Did you expect this, uh, this to be as big a deal as it is? Are you Not surprised? Much turnout. It's great, isn't it? Right. Have you met any other people from Kentucky? Uh, not from Kentucky. Uh, we've met a lot of people and enjoyed meeting them, but not from Kentucky. Harry, what do you think of all this? Well, it's very exciting. Uh, we, uh, you know, we started out this morning, and when we first got here, we were cold, and, and but the reception here has been real exciting, and we've heard some exciting remarks from exciting people and, and and we are just excited about what's happened here today how is business back in kentucky well we're a relatively new dealer there and uh of course when we entered uh, uh, this market we didn't know exactly what to expect but uh, from what uh the other dealers that i've talked to uh, we i think are, are re really getting more than i share of business uh considering the area that we are pulling from. Are you working with your customers and telling them to write their congressmen and senators and to spread the word about we, the help we need? We have talked to them quite a bit about this. Regard as the video cassette recorder, and I think we would like to see this occur if possible. A consumer has a variety of options available when they want to go out and buy a VCR. They can go shopping. They're not forced to go to one store in town that's dictating the prices and selling the machine. Once they get the machine, they have additional choices from where they want to rent tapes or buy tapes. This makes the marketplace competitive. Prices, as a result, come down. And I think the, the problem that we're seeing now is that these various plans have been used primarily through the cable television operator. That's right, Joe, and that means that there is no competition. And even if the cable television operator makes that programming available to the home earth station user, even if it's at the same price as the cable subscriber gets it, to us that's not fair. Fair means a price that is determined by open competition in a free marketplace. And that is exactly what we don't have here, and that is exactly why the legislation is so very important at this point. And in fact, we are doing a push on that legislation. We have had all of the data from Satellite Earth Station Day. Everybody who wrote to us, thank you. We have got all that data computerized now. 
and we are doing a major push on the Senate legislation. We think that the WOR situation, the TCI situation are really rallying points for us. It is an opportunity for us to go back now to the Senate and say, look, Senator, TCI is doing this, no competition. WOR will not be available to me. And as you know, Joe, a grand total of 13 of the most popular channels are going to be scrambled in 1986. That is subs subscription and basic services. HBO, Movie Channel Showtime, Cinemax, v Cinemax VH1, Nickelodeon, CNN, right, ESPN. They will all be scrambled by this summer. They will all be using the Maycom Video Cipher 2 system. And I think it's pretty clear to us through letters we've received in our office that have been made available to us, Cleo Carlisle, Davis Marketing, we've received letters they've gotten from Maycom that there are not enough decoders to go around. There simply aren't enough decoders to go around, and that's a real problem. Senate needs to know about that problem. Robin, if I can just interrupt here so that we can go to a station break, and we'll return right after. The Contronics Trans 8, a great antenna. This transparent 8-foot antenna delivers an out-of-this-world picture to you. Not only does it perform, it looks great. A low-luster appeal with a baked acrylic thermoset black finish. The Trans 8 aims to get the best signals. Caltronics antenna test results are based on the use of chaparral feed horns, recommended for all Caltronics antennas. The Trans 8, another quality antenna from the quality people at Caltronics. Want to know more about satellite TV? Then go to the source for product reviews and how to. We are on the road and out in space and sometimes in very cold places with features and technical reports. It's all in satellite TV. That's only $19.95 for 12 big issues of STV Magazine. Call now, 1-800-438-2020, and get this LCD calendar clock free with your subscription. That's 12 big issues of STV Magazine and the clock for only $19.95. The number again is 1-800-438-2020. 1-800-438-2020. Call now. Welcome back. We were discussing very briefly scrambling. And uh, just before we make any recommendations on what we would like uh, our dealer members and manufacturer and distributor members to do, uh, we want to take a, the next couple of minutes to go into a tape from the um, Judiciary Committee, uh, Rick Brown, testified, I believe it was uh, about two weeks, two weeks ago, ago, Robin. Before, yeah, why, don't you, why don't you tell Congressman us? Congressman Kastemeyer held a hearing on the effect of new technologies on copyright, and it was an excellent opportunity for us to discuss the benefits of satellite earth station technology. And the Congressman asked some very probing and poignant questions, and I think Rick's answers gave the congressional members who were there and the audience and members of the press in particular some real insight into the critical problems that the satellite earth station industry faces with scrambling. So I think we have a cut of a couple of those questions and answers now. Good. I think we'll go to that now. Uh, in network scrambling, to protect their feeds, is that the idea? Mr. Chairman, you put me in an extreme. Uh, the networks, which are licensed, or their, their O&O stations, or licensees of the commission, have a public interest obligation uh, to serve the widest possible audiences. I find it hard to believe uh, that CBS would, would now, after years of trying to maximize their aud audience, are going to try and shrink it. I do have some idea on, s on some of the reasons. One of the reasons, which uh, we can understand, is that some of the feeds going into the network, let's say their news gathering activities, which are not yet refined, are available on satellite. We can find those if we look for them. But we can't argue against the encryption of, of that kind of material. But what goes out of the network to the local broadcasters for retransmission, we've got 1.2 out of our 1.7 million probably that can't watch the networks and can't receive it from a local affiliate. 
So we think that they ought to be required to provide that signal. Any possible slight diminution in revenues to local affiliates caused by home earth station viewing has to be so minuscule as to be not noticeable. In fact, most people that watch satellite earth stations um, have the famous AB switch and, and switch off the satellite to watch their, uh, their local programming, their local networks. They don't watch it on satellite. With respect to the mm -hmm. interfacing, uh, those earth station owners who are within the presently op uh, present uh, uh, operational limits of a cable operator and those that are not, is there any distinction that could be made in that connection? I think there should be no very useful purposes. First useful purpose is it brings television to those that never had it. That's, that's the rural areas. And it's done a fabulous job. I mean, we've had the power of, and we've had the promises of UHF, we've had the promises of MDS, we've had the promises of cable, we've had the promises of low power. This technology is delivered. But now let's talk about inside the cable area. Last year, this Congress deregulated cable's rates. And what have they done? They have tried, through forming a consortium, through, through imploring the programmers to scramble and be cable friendly, to have a monopoly in the distribution of programming. I would like to see every American get this programming at the lowest possible cost. But the Congress ought to be looking at it. And the way to do that is through competition to cable. We have deregulated cable on the premise that there was competition. And I think we ought to ensure that competition. So I don't see the validity of any distinction between outside and inside a cable. We did hear the testimony earlier from the Copyright Office that uh, sometime early next year there should be approximately 100,000 uh, decoding devices available uh, to be acquired by that 1.75 million Earth Station owners. Obviously, there will not be enough decoding devices available for all of those who may choose uh, to, to purchase them uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. And I suppose that uh, that fact underlies uh, your organization's support for the moratorium legislation. Am I correct in that uh, yeah, assumption? Yes, it does. Um, moratorium is a resting period to make sure that all these people that are going to have to suffer under payment and suffer under scrambling can do so with ease and that we can have an adequate transition. Uh, your colleague, uh, Congressman uh, Mazzoli, asked before uh, whether the problem of the decoder will be solved because we'll have one decoder. I'm not so sure it's in the interests of the American public and of our industry to have just one encoding technology. We have a decoder that is being promised at around $400 uh, to add on to a, a consumer's uh, earth station. Um, but I have been told by other manufacturers that they would be able to provide other manufacturers uh, such as Oak Industries, that they would be able to provide um, the, the microelectronics, the chipsets, to the satellite receiving industry, and that other decoder manufacturers could provide these chipsets so that we could have two or three or even four decoders built in to that very receiver that you see over there at a price less than the $400 uh, net that uh, the MACOM uh, add-on set is going to be available for. That would provide competition in the field of decoders and make sure that the price of decoders uh, remained low. Book manufacturing. What is the anticipated method of distribution of, of the decoders that will be manufactured? And how would you have the process changed, both with respect to manufacturing and with respect to distribution? Uh, there are several companies that have developed encoding mechanisms, including uh, MACOM, Scientific Atlanta, Oak Industries, General Instruments, and others. I believe some 15 companies responded to the NCTA request for proposals on scrambling signals. The, the company that would appear to have the lead in decoding right now is MACOM. It has uh, received orders from Movie Channel, Showtime, Home Box Office, Cinemax, and Cable News Network, and now WOR, uh, for uh, decoding. It is my understanding that MACOM will furnish a facility, a centralized facility, a uh, computer that can be used by all the programming services uh, that would scramble the signal 
through this uh, computer and they would then have access, uh, consumer would have access either through the cable operator or uh, through the programming service or if there were independent distribution. My understanding is that Maycom uh, intends to distribute its decoders through its normal distribution channels, which in our industry includes distributors of earth station equipment uh, who then um, redistribute to retailers uh, such as Mr. Haley who then uh, send to the public. All kinds of questions, however, are raised in our mind. What happens when you take that Maycom or any other decoder, attach it to that receiver and the equipment? Does it void the warranty? Who is responsible for it? Um, uh, how much is it going to cost? Is it going to be made available within the receiving manufacturing industry? In other words, can we buy the chipsets from Macom so that we can build it in for maybe $50 or $75 and not have to pay $400 for it? These kinds of, of questions are the ones that, that, that make us believe that a moratorium is essential so they can be resolved before we have this grand experiment with 2 million soon to be two and a half or three million people by the end of, end of next year. Before, before Robin gives a little bit of an explanation on Rick's tape, I'd like to at least mention the telephone numbers that will be available for call-in uh, within the next few minutes on the show. And if you do have a pencil, please uh, make a note of this right now. There are two numbers, area code 202-737. 0251. The second number, area code 202 737 0252. If you're calling in to ask a question, I think that we have the first call coming in. Okay, before we have uh, the first caller come in, Robin, if you can just do a brief recap of Rick's speech and make a suggestion. Well, I think Rick's speech as usual, speaks for itself. Um, but what you can do at home and what you need to know is that we're trying to do a push on the Senate legislation. The bill is at 1618, introduced into the Senate by Senator Gore. There are three co-sponsors now, Senator Gore, Cochran, and Lexalt. Write to your senators. Tell them WOR is scrambling. Tell them 13 programs, basic and subscription, will be scrambled that there are only 100,000 decoders, so Maycom says, and that you want to continue watching these programs. Tell them you need their support on S1618 and on a two-year moratorium bill in the Senate. The two-year moratorium bill has not been introduced in the Senate yet, but ask their support on the proposal, on the philosophy of a two-year moratorium. And please, send us copies of your letters of Brown and Finn. We can use them in our lobbying effort here, and always, Go ahead, write your congressman on 1769 and H.R. 1840. Those are the two bills in the House of Representatives. They can always use your correspondence, but please focus on the Senate bill, S. 1618, and you can just write to your senator, U.S. Senate, Washington, D.C., 20510. Thank you, Robin. I believe we have our first caller. Could you repeat your name? Okay, we're ready for your question. No, I'm here. No. Okay, that's. I think that's better. Yes. Okay, we're ready for your question. Well, I think uh, we better. Next call, please. Go ahead, please. I'm Joe Kelsch with an announcement for you dealers out there. Would you like a TV commercial produced for you at a cut rate? If so, you can join the Space Dealer Consumer Awareness Program. The purpose is to drive potential Earth Station owners to your store for a demonstration of your equipment. The program will be supported with national and local advertising with your store name listed in all ads. You'll receive a complete dealer kit with point of purchase material. Make checks payable to Space Sweepstakes, Space Sweepstakes, and mail to Space at 300 North Washington Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 
The phone number for space is 703-549-6990. If you have any questions, you can also call Dave Vengus at the Litchfield Group. His number is 212-598-0600. You can charge it to your Visa, Master Charge, or American Express card. The cost is $300 plus $50 per store if you want the TV spot produced for you that you can tag on with your store's name. Radio spots available too. This is the Space Dealer Consumer Awareness Program. If you have questions, you can call Space or Dave Vengus at the numbers listed on the screen. Hello. Hi, I'd like that. No way. I think the question uh, basically was why can't a purchaser at the time of purchase uh, pay for the subscription through some form of payment right at the uh, location where he purchases the dish? Good question. And in fact, Space in 1982 and 1983 made exactly those same proposals to the people who have the copyrights to the programming. They did not want to deal with it. We called it a point of sale license. And in fact, it's very similar to the system that subsequently was set up by the Motion Picture Association to receive royalties from the purchase and sale of VCR and videotapes. That is a proposal we have discussed with a number of senators and congressmen, and which they are aware of. If Capitol Hill was responsive to it, I think the earth station industry would certainly be willing to pay under that kind of a scheme. We think it's a very valid idea, but it just has not gotten any support from the people who own the copyrights to the programming. I think, Robin, too, that at least as far as the superstations su such as WOR are concerned, that was the point of Rick's testimony that maybe some kind of a royalty or fee payment can be structured. Yes, that is a concept that space has long supported. Uh, next question, please. Hello? Go ahead, yes. Hello? Yes, hi. How are you? Am I on the air? You're on the air. Okay, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, does there appear to be a uh, unified attack on the, uh, the right to the public to monitor uh, the, the airwaves, such as uh, last year when they attempted to uh, limit the, uh, the receiving our satellite signals, and now uh, this year with the Electronic Communication Privacy Act of 1985, where they're limiting uh, the, uh, the audio I think that. Are you the to you. <laughs> Robin, was that? Uh, yeah. The, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. There's, there's no doubt. Yes, that that is going on. But it is a, it is there is a legitimate problem. For many years, businesses and even the government, everybody used la long lines to communicate. And now, with your information going out over satellite, anyone who knows how to receive the information can receive the information. And some of it is legitimately private information. It's information a company doesn't want the general public to know. And through traditional means of communication, a member of the public would not have access to that communication. So there's, there's equities on both sides of the coin here. I think it's the sort of thing that uh, the superstations are legitimately concerned about people monitoring their raw feeds because that is not the type of information they want going out to the public. I don't know if it's necessarily a government crackdown. Do you, do you feel it's like that, Joe? Well, I think that the government has set aside different frequency bands for 
the broadcast of uh, over-the-air transmissions and uh, at least has allocated a number of frequencies for public usage. So it's, it's, it's a very tough question to say whether it's in some way inhibiting the public's right to view or to listen to. To monitor, to, monitor. to the airwaves. Yeah, it is a tough question. Uh, we're going to go on to the next question. Go ahead, please. Okay, go ahead, please. Next question. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, I'm Terry Young from San Marcos, Texas. Hello, Terry. How are you? And fine. I, uh, I just wanted to ask y'all uh, what y'all thought of a small satellite dealership that, uh, say, begun a year and a half ago to do in a situation where you have a cable company franchise area and uh, they have threatened you with cable ads and other means that they can afford that you maybe can't. And uh, what you do about the threat marketplace to, to let people know that the scrambling issue is not that important right right now as far as uh, a threat directly to them in that we're going to have a whole lot of programming left. This is the exact area that we're trying to address with all of our campaigns, our public relations campaigns, our consumer awareness campaigns, and the upcoming advertising campaign that we're going to begin uh, sometime next week to focus in on these issues. It's very important that uh, you as a dealer go right back into your local newspaper and advertise and also to try to at least begin some kind of relationship with the editor of your local newspaper, the local radio station, and possibly the local television station. You have to at least try to establish some kind of dialogue, and we can help you at least begin there. It might be through a letter or through, through a telephone call. Just informing them of what's going on. If, you need assistance, we can provide that for you. Have the local editors call us at Space, and we can inform them if they're not aware of the fact that there are hearings scheduled to begin in early 1986, that we have two bills in the House, that we have one in the Senate, and that the Justice Department is now investigating all of these activities that you're discussing right here. Jerry, do you have anything to? The best thing I can think of for a smaller dealership such as he's describing is join the Consumer Awareness the Sweepstakes Program. Uh, you'll, your name will be on all the advertising that's done in your area. If you see any ads that are coming out uh, by any local agencies or a, a, a programming sources that you feel are in violation of what you've heard here tonight on this program, make copies of those ads if they're in the newspaper. Um, if they're a radio or a TV ad, get as much of the copy down as you can as far as the substance and contact Brown and Finn. Uh, they will advise you as to whether or not there are some uh, inequities or whether or not what is being advertised is correct. And uh, they can probably take action there. In past cases, I know they have contacted uh, various cable companies, uh, different uh, associations which have given some adverse advertising and uh, made them aware of exactly where they were wrong uh, and what the, our position was on it. And in most cases, it, it does stop it. So I take those steps. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, the next caller is Peter Moore, I believe. Your, your question, please, Peter. Yeah, my question is, will uh, decoders be made available to Canadians, if at all? Uh, where is our Canadians going to be as far as decoders go? Well, we don't want to leave uh, Canadians. Are available at all? Uh, Robin, you want to take that question? Well, we don't want to leave Canadians out, but right now it doesn't seem like decoders are being to <laughs> available to Americans or anybody else, for that matter. As I said, we have received correspondence, uh, copies that dealers have sent us that they received from MACOM, and apparently MACOM's policy at this time is if you are a dealer, you have to buy at least 300 decoders. They cost $325 a piece. You have to pay for them in advance. You cannot purchase them directly from MACOM. They must be purchased either from your local cable operator or an authorized MACOM dealer. And the dealers that we have spoken with who have tried to contact a cable company or a MACOM dealer to get a decoder have been told that there aren't any for sale. That's the feedback we've had here in Washington, D.C. So far, 
none of the dealers that we've spoken with have been able to get a decoder, even to try it out, even to see what it's like. My guess is eventually, if and when decoders ever become readily available, there's no reason why Canadians or Mexicans or any other neighboring country or throughout Latin America won't be able to purchase decoders. But right now, the problem seems to be that there aren't any decoders for sale. If you do make an attempt and you fail at that attempt, please notify us. And if there's any correspondence between you and uh, the distributors, uh, send us those letters. Yeah, indeed, because it points up the whole problem we're having here. 13 premium cable and subscription programs are going to be scrambled in 1986. Although you may not want to watch all of those 13 programs, chances are if you're an Earth Station user, you want to watch one or two or three or whatever. Yet, nobody can seem to find any decoders. And in 1986, we're talking 2 million home Earth Station users. Even taking the numbers we've heard, that MACOM has put out that there will be 100,000 decoders available sometime in 1986 that won't even come close to meeting the demand of the 2 million users. So it's a problem. Our next caller, uh, Jack, your question, please. Yes, uh, Jack Vanderbilt. <coughs> OK, my question is this. On these uh, decoders, if it is so easy to and code a program and uh, the originators of the program decide to change the code just because they would benefit say a certain area or a certain program how are we if we can get a decoder to know how to change this decoder in order to receive this program well jack i think you know to answer your question briefly, and I think Jerry will have something to add, the way I understand the Video Cipher 2 works, it, it need only be addressed one time so that once you are authorized to receive a program service, uh, you will not have to change your channel selector to any specific station every time you want to view a program so that you won't have that problem. Jerry, do you have anything? I, I'm, not, I'm not quite so sure of that response. Uh, that that is in, case, in, in fact the case. Uh, I was part of, as I think you might be aware, uh, last spring a test that was done on the video cipher unit, uh, that unit being different in that it was for the head end at the cable companies. Uh, but we found that the instructions that were given uh, with that unit, uh, the parameters and the ranges uh, in order to set it up were not quite the ranges that we found it to work under. It, it accepted a much broader range than what the specifications called for. Uh, as far as the question is concerned, I think that the biggest problem is the availability of the decoders. I don't think that there is too much concern about whether or not the technology is a viable one or whether or not it's been perfected. At this point, it appears from everything that we can see that uh, they've got a pretty good handle on the technology itself and that once it becomes uh, available to dealers, if it becomes available to dealers, that uh, from past experience with MACOM, uh, there will be a sufficient amount of uh, educational material on how to set up the, the unit itself. We have another caller. Your question, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, Marie. Um, I think the best solution would be an annual licensing fee for all home, home earth stations, say a hundred dollars, which would be used to pay programmers for their product. The penalty for operation of an earth station without the license of a high fine and confiscation of their equipment would certainly make everyone comply with such a law, and the, the fee for the license would be distributed to programmers by a formula agreed to by programmers who provide unscrambled signals. This fee would pay all programmers at or very near the rate that they are now paid by cable companies for each subscriber. I don't, they would have captive audience of all home stations, so they shouldn't have to make exorbitant profits because they would get it from everybody. It wouldn't be um, a la carte, as they're always saying, they charge us more because of that, because we would be getting everything just like the cable companies do, and it should work. It should uh, work. I think it's a great suggestion. The only problem with it is 
It needs the consent of the people who hold the copyrights and the programming, and so far that consent has not been forthcoming. If they refuse to cooperate, it will be very hard to convince Congress to override or to go totally against the kind of input they're getting from the copyright holders. Now, in all fairness, too, that is exactly the way, the, the method you've just described is exactly the way cable operators pay for the copyright to use broadcast programming. And every year, there is an incessant fight amongst the copyright holders about who gets what portion of the pool. Do broadcasters get more than the joint sports interest? Do they get more than the movie people? And it goes on and on and on. But as a basic suggestion, we think it's a good suggestion. What we need is some support from the copyright holders in order to get it through Congress. And we hope that if we continue to maintain that position, that it is a good position, Congress might see that it is the best solution to this problem, Marie. It is a very good suggestion. Thank you, Robin. I believe the next caller is uh, Ro Rodney from Texas. Go, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have more than a, a uh, question, I have a comment. I've sold several uh, television systems and it seems to me that uh, people in the people that buy these television systems really can't afford to pay that amount of money for a decoder and the people in the cable areas are going to be the ones that end up paying the big expense and there isn't there needs to be an attempt made to inform them of that. Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I've, he I've heard various plans, depending on the dealer, you may not have to pay for one to begin with if that dealer is leasing the sale or leasing the equipment itself. Uh, Robin, do you have Yeah, any? we've heard that. M a lot of speculation is that with the next generation of satellite receivers, the Dakota will be built in. And we have brought to Congress's attention that could be a problem if Maycom either is the only company that has the technology and is the only company who can build in a decoder into the receiver, or if they will only make that technology available at unreasonable prices, it will give them a terrific edge in the marketing of satellite receivers with a built-in decoder. So down the road, I don't think, I think you will see the satellite systems with the decoders built in. In the meantime, for those people who have to buy add-ons because their receivers don't have built-in decoders, I think, as Joe, as Joe said, hopefully the marketplace will demand the development of programs where either the homeowner can rent the decoder, lease the decoder, get it free for a certain period of time, or some way to recognize that all consumers cannot finance outright the cost of what looks like is going to be a $300, $400 item. Thank you, Robin. We have another question. I believe it's Gerald. Go, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, concerning uh, scrambling, will piracy, will they uh, be able to tell if you're being a pirate, or uh, will the FCC be able to, to figure out if uh, you are uh, being a pirate and getting the, old, getting the signal from, from uh, wherever, you know, if you get a, a, a black market uh, descrambler, and if uh, they can uh, pull you, you know, figure out whether you're uh, getting the signal without paying for it, can this be done by the FCC or, or whatever? Because when Congress doesn't act and, and no action is being taken, and, and space is doing a great job, I really believe that, but when Congress is taking uh, the, the time that they're taking and the way Turner's operating can, uh, it's going to promote piracy and, and, and those that, that build the boxes, we don't want to get caught and we don't want to, uh, we, just, we want to be able to, to have what's, what's ours and what, what isn't ours. I, I think, first of all, we don't want to recommend that anybody goes out and, and buys a uh, black box that's unauthorized. Uh, secondly, from what I understand about Maycom's equipment, they say it's almost foolproof that each individual household will be addressed on a continuous basis and that it will be able to almost decipher an, un an unaddressed box, meaning that it would render your box, whether or not you have a black box decoder available, it would render it useless. 
Yeah, that's what we hear too. But you've had some hands-on experience. Is that the situation? Well, you know, you, you, you get all the uh, you get all the feedback, and you hear all the people talking about well, so such and such a receiver, or so so and so has come up with a technology to decode, to unscramble the HBO signal, the Maycom signal, the video cipher signal. One thing that I haven't heard anybody comment on is anyone being successful. Uh, those that have uh, said that they have seen or heard of this technology breakthrough, if that's what it is. Uh, ever cracking the, the audio end of it, which is uh, uh, the technology there, I, I guess, from what I, from what I understand, is, uh, is a much, much broader band of uh, scrambling, and it's, uh, and it's very, very difficult, if at all possible, to decode. Uh, so at best, uh, these, uh, these pirated boxes, uh, if they were to become in, in existence, uh, it's questionable whether or not they would actually perform uh, to give the the purchasers or the uh, the makers of them uh, the end result that they're looking for. So at this time, that's that's really a nebulous area. We really don't uh, we don't even wish to get into that because we aren't proponents of that in any way, shape, or form. The next caller is John from San Antonio. You're yes, my well, question my question is that uh, are we going to be charged or I'm sorry? have to get two or three, four or five decoders for one particular army breach services, and also why are the cable services charging us anywhere from two to three times as much as they charge the regular subscribers? For example, it's six dollars on, on uh, Showtime or HBO, but it's, it's, it's as much as 12 to 19 dollars, I understand, for the satellite system. I'll hang up and listen. First of all, the way the uh, system has been announced with at least the programmers who have announced a plan to date, I would say that there's more than a 99% chance that there will only need to be one decoder. So that, rest assured, you're not going to have to go out and buy more than one decoder. I think for the second part of the, uh, the question you were you were mentioning the policies of, uh, I believe, Showtime in charging $6. And I don't think that was Showtime's policy. To date, they have not announced a policy. TCI has announced a policy. TCI is the largest cable company in the country. They have come out with some type of plan to provide several pay TV services and a package of basic services at a, uh, uh, I don't know, what exactly the price is? I think it was thirty-two dollars for the whole package. Was it okay? Yeah. So that, in essence, you you may be able to break out the pay TV service for a price of six dollars, but you may have to. It may be conditioned on the requirement that you buy a whole package of services. Uh, the other, Robin, go on. Well, I think what you said is correct. That it appears at least all thirteen services that we heard are scrambling are going to be used Maycom Video Cipher 2 system, we do not necessarily think that that's a good thing. Even though it's one scrambling system, it means no competition in the, in the construction of decoders, in the manufacture, in the sale. It means it's all coming from one company. It is a very double-edged sword. We think that the only way to get a fair price is to have competition. In other words, we, t again, we, we think that there will be one box. We rest assured there will be the one box. What we would like to see is a number of manufacturers supplying that box and distributing that box. Yeah. So but that uh, we have an ex the next caller is Jerry from Nashville. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I had a couple of comments and maybe uh, bring some questions. Uh, one thing I've uh, about scrambling is uh, let me turn the other TV set down a second. I'm getting feedback here. Uh, one thing I was watching recently a Canadian broadcasting station, and uh, they was having a telethon. And if they had been scrambling, I would not have gotten it. And by them not being scrambled, uh, I was able to make a contribution towards a telethon for some crippled children. And if they had been a scrambled station. I would have not be able to gotten it, and uh, I had mentioned it to them that there's a lot of satellite users out there, and for them to put their area code there so people would know where to call into Canada. And not long after that, they did put their area code number. So there was one thing, one case where uh, 
not being scrambled helped out. Also, um, the advertisers for a lot of the shows that uh, are supposedly cable shows, they have a lot of advertisers. And I believe that these advertisers realize that there's a lot of people out there with satellite dishes watching their advertisements. Uh, they're losing a large audience when they're scrambled. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with the uh, movie channels, but uh, one person brought up another question I had, too, which I think has already been answered, and that was dealing with uh, illegal decoders, that maybe that would open another market. We're running out of time here. Could you get, could you get to your question? Okay. Uh, the main question is on uh, the standard. Uh, if they did like they did stereo, could they possibility have it set up and have one type of format for descrambling? And then uh, they had three different formats for stereo, and they uh, they uh, didn't have it set up correctly, so everybody came out with L type standard. So I, I was wondering. Yes, I, I think you know we understand your question, and it it. It will evolve into that type of standard, as far as we can see. I think the technology yeah. is very young right now. It makes no sense to put the consumer into that type of position. And the video cassette industry is a good example. There was a beta format and a VHS format. Right. And it appears that the VHS format is winning out. And I think the same thing will happen with our industry in, in setting a uh, format. We have a caller from uh, Allen, Texas. Uh, his name is Wayne. Go ahead, please. Yes, my question is, does there appear to be any change in the attitude of the programmers regarding uh, supplying the programming, uh, the, the, the scramble program and the descramblers? Um, HBO and Cinemax in particular, I've noticed, have recently uh, been advertising heavily in the trade publications, but yet uh, I've ca called them and written them both and still have received absolutely uh, no response from them regarding this their advertising. So is this indicative of what we can expect when they, they do start making the service available? I think right, right now, confusion seems to be the byword on the scrambling front. At this time, nobody really has their system in place to serve home satellite or station users. It, it would be wrong to malign HBO as a company and the way they run. I don't know. I don't have cable, so I can't say, but HBO is a big corporation. I'm sure that they can run something efficiently. Right now, the problem is that nobody has got a workable program to serve the home satellite or station industry. And HBO, Movie Channel, Showtime, none of the other programmers are willing to sell their programming to any, there, there are a couple, to any kind of consortium, cooperative company that wants to distribute to the home earth station company. We hope that that is what will develop, that there will develop services that go to HBO and say to HBO, let me sell your program to the home earth station user, and that these services will come in, fill in the gap, and then the home earth station user will get good, reliable service from these companies. That's what we hope to see develop. I think it'll happen. Thank you. I think that is a good ending note here, just to tie the whole program together. And uh, maybe w if we can just make some points now on what we need to do and what we would encourage uh, the viewers and the members of space to do at this point, and that is to uh, supply us with information when you run into these situations where you're in touch with program networks or you're in touch with hardware suppliers and you're running into these difficulties, we need to hear your story and your problems. Thank you. And uh, Robin and Jerry, do you have anything that you would like to add within the next 20 seconds? <laughs> I, I would encourage the consumers to become consumer members of space. We encourage them uh, for that communication and for the sweepstakes program for dealers. At this point, We'd like you to tune in same time next week on the same transponder, and, and we look forward to seeing you again. We hope you enjoyed the show.